Hello, everyone. Thank you for stopping by this poster. My name is Ao Liu. I'm the Deputy Director of Research at Euclid Tech Labs. Today, I'm going to talk about the work we've done on the feasibility of alkali antimonide photocathode encapsulation using RF sputtering of 2D thin films. I'm speaking today on behalf of the team composed of several Euclid colleagues and our BNL collaborators. The PI from the BNL side is Dr. Adon Wan, and this project was funded by the DOE Office of Science from the Basic Energy Science Department under the contract number DSC002057-3. Some background for today's talk. As you all know, alkali antimonide or the bi-alkali antimonide photocathodes have been used at many facilities for all kinds of purposes because it's high, ultra high QE, uh, relatively low mean transverse energy and the relatively low requirements for their growth. Um, they are very suitable for photo guns for high brightness light sources, hadron cooling, high current, low energy beam lines. They have been proven to have long lifetime in high gradient SRF gun. Uh, this work has been recently published by a, a team led by uh, Dr. Ardon Wan, our BNL collaborator. Uh, this is a paper published, published on scientific reports in 2021. However, these photocathodes require extremely stringent vacuum, usually less than 10 to minus 10 torr. Therefore, it is very challenging to transport these photocathodes after their growth. Usually they have to be stored in a photocathode garage. And if you wanna use it in some photogun, then you will have to use some load log. If you wanna do some um, characterization of the material, you also will need to transport them through a load lock system also. During their transportation, you will expect the lifetime of the photocathode to be significantly reduced if the vacuum is not that good. Therefore, long distance transportation of these high QE photocathodes is not practical. So how are we gonna solve that problem? Many, many researchers have been thinking about protecting the photocathode um, mainly through two ways. The first way is to physically encap encapsulate the photocathode. There are several advantages of that. Um, first of all, for this technique, sealing and unsealing both happen in USB. And they're almost guaranteed to work because you know exactly where and what the failure modes are. However, there are certain cons for this approach, including its relatively higher cost, the requirement for additional dedicated hardware to be set up at both the growth facility and the user facility. Also, you might be expecting some possible contamination during the unsealing process at the user facility. On the other hand, people have been thinking to encapsulate the photocathode, the surface, using some electron transparent 2D thin film. There are many, many pros for this approach. It doesn't require any add-on hardware for the user facility because you are not just using the encapsulated photocathode. There are only trivial changes to the photocathode growth facility too. The QE can be preserved by the 2D thin film uh, encapsulation. And this is proven by some density functional theory simulations, which indicated that some 2D materials can even lower the work function, i.e. Uh, increase the quantum efficiency accordingly. Um, the DFT simulations also indicated that the thin film could reject harmful gas molecules or provide protection for the photocathode, which is what we desire. This includes uh, molecules like oxygen, which is very um, harmful for the photocathode. 
there are some challenges that are sort of unknown. Also, the reason why we need to do the study. How do we get the 2D thin film onto the photocathode as the encapsulation? And will it actually protect the photocathode? Well, first we can start from simulation guidance. People have done some DFT simulations for this study or similar studies. The DFT simulations provide fundamental insights for thin film properties, such as adhesion, band structure, spin polarities, work functions, et cetera, for the um, encapsulation work. Uh, what we are particularly interested in are the work functions of the um, 2D thin film coated alkali antimonide and using the ad atom approach to simulate the encapsulation protection effectiveness. Uh, for DFT simulations, we are using an open source software called Quantum Espresso. This software can be installed on almost any Linux cluster. Uh, we installed that on our Lorentz multi-core cluster at Euclid. It is an in-house cluster that we built for all kinds of simulation purposes. Also, Quantum Espresso exists for NERSC at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. However, no matter which cluster or supercomputer you're using, um, Quantum Espresso is still, or DFT simulations in general, are still extremely computationally intensive. It's common to take days to finish each job. So on the right, you can see some of the DFT simulations we did for making sure that the HBN or hexagonal boronitride can grow on, for example, copper single lattice structures. You can find a D equilibrium showing that there is a minimum for the growth, which means that at this minimum, the thin film will be in a stable state. And also you can see from some other simulations we did uh, showing the work function calculation through the DFT approach. Other groups have also done DFT work, had shown excellent results and promising results for us to proceed. This includes some uh, work published on MPJ in 2018. Um, our DFT simulations done independently at Euclid had agreed with, their public, with the published results. Uh, you can find a lot of detailed work in this paper, but mainly the results sh show that uh, 2D thin films, especially hexagonal boronitride, can preserve the work function of alkali antimonides. Specifically, HBN can even lower the work function of alkali antimonides. Graphene is the opposite, but still the additional work function added for from a monolayer of graphene is very small. Also, independently, we did some DFT simulations to predict the protection effect for which the work was permanently demonstrated by a group led by Dr. Liu. Uh, and this work was published on APL in 2017. Basically, they had shown that in uh, per vacuum, if you have a graphene covered copper, of course, single lattice 110 structure, the QE can be preserved. We used an add atom DFT simulation, basically putting one single oxygen atom above the encapsulated photocathode to show that total energy for the system increases whenever you go to the barrier of the 2D thin films. This is true for monolayer and bilayer and uh, tri-layers of uh, HBN thin films. We did that on copper, and we also did that for K2CSSB, the alkali, bioalkali antimonide. And we are expecting to do some experimental work in the near future. So the simulations have indicated that this work is worth pursuing. Then the next question is how to get the 2D thin films on photocathodes. There are several approaches to get the thin film de deposited on the 
um, photo cathode. For this IPEC poster, we are talking about the RV spur spurring approach. There is another approach that we are actively working on is, is a procedure that we um, first transfer the 2D thin film onto the antimony substrate, and then we grow the photocathode through a cesium intercalation. This is, again, being done uh, by a collaboration between Euclid and BNL. Okay, getting back to the RF sputtering, the RF sputtering is one of a, uh, the PVD or physical vapor deposition methods. It is superior than other uh, deposition methods in virtually all aspects, including the thin film density and the thickness uniformity, the step coverage and the interface quality, the, uh, its low temperature deposition feasibility and the deposition rate in general, and the applicability or the cost. This enables us to get the system established with our phase one SBIR funding. At Euclid Tech Labs, we have several DC or RF sputtering systems. If you're interested, you can feel free to visit our website and visit our capabilities. Although RF sputtering has so many superior properties, growing 2D thin films in general is extremely challenging and for sputtering too. So we developed a dedicated system in order to avoid any other contamination and also to, to satisfy the USV requirements for photocathodes. So for this system, we also need a cathode garage and the load logs. And we also took that those into account. In order to make sure that the 2D thin film can be grown, which usually needs high temperature environment to be uh, present, we have also been designing and testing an enhancement method without damaging the photocathode substrate directly like heating the substrate. What is the way to enhance the deposition in sputtering without directly heating up the substrate or interfering the substrate directly? So we, we have been working on a system called a laser oscillator deposition enhancement system or LOADS for short. This concept was inspired by another concept of a gas loaded laser attenuator, which has been and is being um, actively investigated at SLAC. Their work has been published in many places, but I found this uh, schematic drawing very useful, which was published at FEL 2019. Basically, um, in this concept, the laser transfers energy to the gas in each passage through the gas loaded chamber. We will have a similar thing in a sputtering system where there are argon gas and there are also uh, sputtered molecules. So if we have a laser passing through the uh, sputtering system through viewports, then the laser is supposedly transferring the energy to the sputter molecules too. We had uh, in our phase one work developed this system shown in here, which uh, builds a laser cavity. And in the cavity, we can have some buildup of the laser, which can get up to 200 times if you consider a realistic viewport transmittance. This will effectively turn a 0.1 milliwatt laser into a uh, 20 milliwatt laser. Also, the um, since it's a laser cavity, each time the laser traverses the sputtering system, it will deposit energy. And the cavity gives you multiple passages. So this compensates the low cross-section of the laser and molecule interaction, and also the low gas pressure in the chamber. Taking that into account, we have developed a dedicated sputtering system called Tumerate, 
for bra and actress buttering. It is fully USB compatible. It works with introducing a um, puck holder or a gripper. It works with the BNL puck style photocathode base. It has a 300 watt RF input power and it uses a two inch PBN target. The chamber incorporates a bipartition design so that uh, part, one part can be used for loads and sputtering and the other is used for vacuum diagnostics, pumping, etc. It has a all metal gate valve for the load lock system to go uh, to insert the photocathode in and the photocathode can be gri uh, grabbed by the gripper shown in here. The whole system has been built so that it can be mobile or can be transported on these wheels. And that will enable us to transport the whole thing to BNL when we want to test the system eventually with the photocathode grown at BNL. It reached low 10 to minus 10 tour in 2024, but however, unfortunately because of the COVID, the system was never used at BNL with the real photocathodes. However, for the bar nitride sputtering, we were able to do that in-house at Euclid. So you can see the plasma was in, the plasma has been activated and during a high power sputtering, the color turned a little red because of the decomposition and loss of nitrogen uh, from the boron nitride target. We went to 32 watt per square inch input power for the nominal sputtering regime. We did the sputtering on both silicon 111 and copper 111 single lattice wafers and characterized those thin films later. So we found that the thin film on the wafers was very dense, but also amorphous. But we did the long sputtering session for each sputtering because we wanted to see the thin film clearly. And although this is not necessarily single lattice structure, the thin film quality was shown under the SEM XPS to be very high. And with this thin film, we are sure that without considering the QE effect yet, this will protect the substrate from oxidation or uh, humidity in air. The XPS shown in here show that we had all the elemental components desired, including the boron and uh, nitrogen. However, the ratio of boron to nitride is shown to be three to one, and which indicates that there was a loss of nitrogen and we might want to consider reactive sputtering in the future to compensate the lost nitrogen. After that, we did some QE measurements. Unfortunately, no other experimental sites available, including the BNL site. So we used our long-term collaborator, uh, Argon Wakefield Accelerator AWA site uh, for the QE test bed. This test bed was modified from a field emission measurement test bed, and it uses a mercury arc lamp and line filter, which selects a um, mercury line at 254 nanometers. The spectrum is between 249.7 and 240.6 nanometers, which is in the UV regime, of course. We measured the incident power between these wavelengths to be 0.49 or 0.5, roughly 0.5 milliwatt. The incident light is normal to the surface and we use a copper grid, which has a five, plus 500 volt bias and a picoammeter to measure the photo current. So we compared a few samples, which included the boron nitride coated copper 111, the uncoated copper 111, and the polished copper holder, which is already there in the system. As you could see for uh, the comparison, the photo current from the boron nitride coated copper 111 was greatly enhanced from the uncoated copper 111, which was predicted from the DFT simulations. 
I should remind everybody that the copper 111 from later research has a higher work function compared to other lattices structures or um, the amorphous copper. That's why you can see that from a polished copper holder, which was basically machined from an oxygen-free copper, the photo current was much lower for the single lattice uh, wafer. Um, so this is a very promising result that the hexagonal boron nitride has uh, even increased the QE for a single lattice copper substrate. Without measuring in, uh, in a very systematic way, the protection effectiveness of boron nitride for copper or any photocathode, uh, we want to bring, out, bring up the synergy of our thin film, recent thin film studies. In this study, we uh, investigated the thin film protection for tungsten at high temperature. And this work is presented in another poster of mine. In order to protect the tungsten, the tungsten uh, target for high energy physics experiments, which will run the tungsten target at high elevated um, temperature for prolonged operation, we use the thin film to protect the tungsten from oxidation. In this study, we have used our in-house nitrogen purged high temperature furnace and a silicon dioxide thin film coated tungsten wafer and a regular naked tungsten wafer. After some heating treatment, we inspected it under the SEM. This heating was done for 24 hours at 1000 degrees C approximately. We realized that the surface color has very significant difference between these two wafers. And you can see that for the naked tungsten, it has already completely oxidized, at least for the surface. However, from this photo, it is seen that the surface of the tungsten is still preserved and it has a metallic look. So whether it is really oxidized or not can be seen from the SEM inspections. So for the thin film protected, you can still see the thin film structure on the surface with the indication that uh, there's somehow some oxidation either at the very, very shallow surface of the tungsten underneath of the thin film. But we are, all, we are confident that um, the SEM has registered the silicon dioxide thin film structure only. So this will be done in a more systematic way in our future studies. But for the naked tungsten, it is very obvious that the surface has oxidized and formed a nanopillar structure. You can see the effect, oxidation effect from the edges and all those edges are, are, are degraded and the tungsten oxide, oxide has uh, fallen into debris off onto the silicon wafer base. So this means that the thin film, a proper selection of thin film can protect the substrate from oxidation very effectively. So some future work is expected for this, uh, these related studies. We would like to do end-to-end -end studies for the boron nitride thin film deposition through our sputtering, um, including adding um, reactive sputtering and do pulsed RF sputtering with higher instantaneous power and swap the target with a lab six target instead of PBN. And we want to do all the characterizations we, we can do that are necessary or relevant for the studies. After that, we can do the sputtering on copper photocathode and do the QE characterization and also check the um, protection for the copper substrate. We will also want to resume the collaboration with BNL through multiple ways 
and eventually test our spelling system at BNL. Also, we would like to demonstrate our enhancement system uh, or loads in, in a real case. For now, the loads is being set up and tested only for the optical purposes. Um, we are creating synergies with other UK SBIR project, including the one in the previous slide and also another one currently active under a um, collaboration with BNL. This time the PI is Dr. Meng Jia Gao Wei um, for the uh, photocathode growth and protection through a thin film transfer and the intercalation method that I introduced in the beginning of this talk. As a summary, we have done DFT, sim DFT simulations at Euclid, including the work function and add atom simulations to suggest that preserve the, thing, the 2D thin films can preserve the uh, work function for or even reduce the work function for uh, alkali antimonide. And also the atom simulations have shown that the thin film can protect the, thing, the substrate or the photocathode from oxidation. We have designed and fabricated a dedicated USB sputtering system turmeric for boron nitride sputtering on photocathodes from scratch. We're designing and testing a laser oscillator or a cavity based sputtering enhance, enhancement system. First results from our regular sputtering, not a reactive sputtering, show that high quality boron nitride thin film and uh, with the correct elemental compos composition can be achieved. However, um, the stoichiometry needs some further optimizations. And future work on systematic deposition studies is needed. We look forward to more collaborations with other institutions. With that, I want to thank everybody for listening to this presentation. Uh, I want to thank the IPAC committee for this opportunity to present our work. And I want to thank all the colleagues who helped in this work. Thank you very much. Please leave your comments and questions in the chat. Thank you.